while, as the saying goes, the pass is a foreign country, it should also be added that some pass are more foreign than others. This is the case for Gaelic Ireland, especially in its final centuries. Constantly denigrated by the English, who accuse it of being poor, backward, archaic, if not barbarian. For the old English, the Gaelic Irish were the other against whom they defined themselves, and against whom, as Ruth Canning has shown, they had proudly shed their blood over many centuries defending the old English kingdom in Ireland. Little did they realise that this kingdom was very much dependent on the existence of the Gaelic and Gaelicized lordships. And with the destruction of the power of these lordships at the end of the Nine Years' War, the Old English, who had already lost many of their privileges under Henry VIII and Elizabeth, would witness the rapid undermining of their power. The collapse of Gaelic Ireland was quickly followed by the destruction of the Old English state. In the 17th century, the traumatic defeats in the 1640s and 50s and in the 1690s produced a new form of state, and a new political, legal, social structure. Although the majority of the population were still Irish-speaking at this time, and there were still some poets trained in the elaborate structures of Gaelic poetry, by 1700, Gaelic Ireland had ceased to exist. In the 1590s, Valencia would have looked very different from today. Parts would probably still have been heavily forested, though oats and barley would have been grown somewhere and there would have been a large number of cattle on the island, as this was something Gaelic Ireland was famous for. The population would have been almost wholly Gaelic, while Valencia was peripheral in relation to Dublin, and even more so in relation to London. Due to its position, its inhabitants would have had a reasonable amount of contact with Spanish, French and Portuguese fishermen, while merchant ships and the occasional warship would have sheltered in Valencia Harbour at times. There were a small number of villages on the island. While there are traces of the stone foundation of the houses of one of these, Crompiole and Bray Head, there does not seem to be any trace of any of the others. It could be these were built using clay or wood with thatched roofs, as were the majority of Gaelic houses at the time. In order to understand Valencia in the 1590s, it's necessary to understand the political context. More specifically, the importance of the McCarthy Moor Lordship. This was the most important Gaelic Lordship in Munster. Often referred to as Desmond, from the Irish Desmumu, South Munster, this consisted of South Kerry and a large part of Cork. However, by the mid-16th century, the McCarthy Moor Lordship had been weakened by the loss of control over some of its cadet branches. McCarthy Ray in Carberry and the Muscarry McCarthys, amongst others, had achieved relative independence from McCarthy Moore. Different from the O'Neills and the O'Donnells in Ulster, the McCarthys had not been able to profit from the collapse of the Lordship of the Isles, something which Hiram Morgan shows was very important for the O'Neills of Dungannon and the O'Donnells in terms of the consolidation of their power. In addition, McCarthy Moore faced considerable interference from the Earls of Desmond. The rivalry between these two goes back to the establishment of the Anglo-Normans in Munster, with the Battle of of Callan in 1261 being of great importance. However, at the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, McCarthy Moore had been reduced to a vassal of the Earls of Desmond, symbolised by the marriage of Donal McCarthy Moore to Honour Fitzgerald, daughter of the 14th Earl of Desmond. As might be guessed, the story becomes more tumultuous. The Earl of Desmond's long fall would shake most of Munster. In 1565, Donald McCarthy Moore was made Earl of Clancare, with the hope that he would stand against Desmond. His legitimate son would soon be given the title of Baron of Valencia. Presumably, this title was chosen because of the importance of Ballycarbury Castle to McCarthy Moore, and because it dominated Valencia Harbour. However, the choice of the name Valencia is interesting, since more often the island was referred to then as Dairy, coming from the Irish name for the island, Dara. The English name Valencia comes from Bailincia, which is the sound separating Port McGee and Valencia. McCarthy Moore was made an earl through the surrender and grand process to act as a counterweight to Desmond, 
who at this stage was in custody. Over the coming years, like so many Irish lords, Donald McCarthy Moore's behaviour was complex. In the conflicts between Desmond and the Crown, McCarthy Moore sometimes supported the Crown and sometimes the rebel. Much of this may have been to ensure that his lands were not burned, as the Crown could not protect him against Desmond. At one stage, he even renounced the title of Earl. However, in the early 1570s, he was largely loyal to the Crown. As a reward, he was given custody of Kilorden Castle in early 1573. He did not hold this long. The same year, Desmond escaped from royal custody and returned to Munster. McCarthy Moore led his troops against Desmond somewhere along the River Main, but was badly defeated and forced to hand over Kilorden. In 1583, Desmond was killed. Two years later, McCarthy Moore and his supporters were formally pardoned of any treasons they may have committed. His son was imprisoned by the English for a while, but escaped to France. However, the downfall of Desmond brought McCarthy Moore no stability. Rather, things got worse. Like many Gaelic lords at this time, McCarthy Moore discovered that the downfall of a traditional rival did not help. Rather, it allowed new players to enter the game, who played by different rules. English settlers and officials. Much of Desmond's lands were divided up and given to newcomers. Due to the complex pattern of land ownership and the very flexible boundaries of lordships, some of McCarthy Moore's lands were caught up in this, leading to various long-lasting court cases. Expensive court cases. McCarthy Moore found himself hemmed in by new settlers and officials, many of whom were not content with the land they had been given and wanted to expand their holdings. This occurred in various ways, some lawful, others not. Donald McCarthy Moore would end up mortgaging a lot of his lands. Despite his vast holdings, he always seems to have been in debt. It should be noted that, although McCarthy Moore was a de facto ruler of Desmond, he did not own most of it. He certainly owned large parts, the traditional McCarthy Moore domains, much of which were scattered around Killarney or around Ballycarbury, as well as some other small tracts around, elsewhere around the Lordship. However, most of the Lordship was held by other seps. These would pay him various sorts of taxes or duties. Large parts of the Lordship were held by other McCarthy seps, some of whom were friendly to McCarthy Moore, others not so much. Much was held by the O'Sullivans, especially O'Sullivan Moore in Ivera, near Dunkellan, uh, which is now near Kenmare, O'Sullivan Bera in Bera, and various others. A number of other smaller seps held other land. As mentioned, McCarthy Moore ended up mortgaging large amounts of his land, much to English newcomers, but also some to Florence McCarthy Ray, a local noble who had aspirations to greatness. Then, in the late 1580s, McCarthy Moore's legal heir, his son Tighe, died. The regrant of McCarthy Moore's lands contained a very bitter sting. In the event that Donald McCarthy died without a legitimate male heir, his lands would revert to the state, who would obviously distribute them among the English. In response to this, McCarthy Moore then pulled off what seemed like an elaborate coup, but which would cause considerable difficulties. Key to this was his daughter, Ellen McCarthy. It was presumed by many that if she married, her husband would inherit most of the lordship. McCarthy Moore first agreed that his daughter, Ellen, would marry Florence McCarthy, conditioned upon the approval of Elizabeth, who would obviously never agree to this, as it would have placed a huge amount of land in the hands of a Gaelic lord. Then, McCarthy Moore mortgaged part of his lands to Valentine Brown, also arranging that the latter's son would marry Ellen. However, neither McCarthy Moore's wife nor various other local nobles would allow this, resulting in Aaron, Ellen marrying Florence McCarthy Ray. Valentine Brown was not impressed, but McCarthy Moore said it had nothing to do with him. Florence McCarthy had hoped to inherit both the McCarthy Ray Lordship in Carberry and the McCarthy Moore one, but was imprisoned by the English. He was eventually released, 
and played a bit part in the Nine Years' War, trying to play both sides, but doing damage to Hugh O'Neill's Confederacy. Ultimately, he would be arrested and spend the best part of three decades in the Tower of London, where he would die. Donald McCarty Moore died in 1597. He was not immediately replaced as McCarty Moore. While it seemed that his preferred heir was his Ill illegitimate son, Oscon Donald, O'Sullivan Moore supported Florence McCarty Ray, who was in prison. Since O'Sullivan Moore played the important role of granting the rod of lordship to the new McCarty Moore, he was able to exercise a sort of veto. Eventually, Florence McCarthy would be inaugurated as the last McCarthy Moore in 1600. The McCarthy Moore Lordship consisted of the Ever and Bear Peninsulas and more. It was of strategic importance. By now, the Nine Years' War had broken out and Hugh O'Neill and his Gaelic Confederacy were fighting and beating the English. Spanish aid for O'Neill was expected, especially in Munster. This made the McCarty moorlands even more important, as they held various ports and harbours where a Spanish force could land. The lordship of Desmond was of great importance to the English crown. Accordingly, in the aftermath of Donald's death, it was decided to survey his lands, both to map out how much he actually held and account for all the various services or taxes he was due for this. The resulting document is of great importance, as it maps out in detail the complex web of landholding in Desmond. In addition, it identifies the various taxes or duties due for this, also listing and trying to explain these. As a result, we have a great deal of information about Gaelic landholding in West Cork and South Kerry, and a wealth of other details. While this may not sound very exciting, when compared to details of battles or fables about gallo glasses and others. It provides a brilliant snapshot of his lordship, on top of which we can build a lot. We'll now turn to Valencia. In 1597-1598, Valencia was divided between McCarthy Moore and two other McCarthy Seps, namely Schlucht Cormac of Dungula and Schlucht Donald Vrick, also referred to as MacTaigne Dua. A relatively detailed map of Valencia was drawn for the survey, which shows the division of the island between the different seps. Its existence is also an indication of the importance of Valencia at this time. Slug Cormac held the north and northwest of the island. This includes what were called the quarters, and which now more or less correspond to the modern townlands of Tinnies, Feyman, Cool, Corbeg, and somewhere called Bryn McCain. The latter is probably an old name for the area near Bray Head, perhaps what is now called Paris by locals. A writer called Anshawak says that Bray Head in Iris was Kjaun Brega and at the time pronounced Kjaun Brie. He also suggests that the original of Bryn McCain may have been Brie Namiawakan. Sluk Cormac also had lands along the Ferta River and other areas facing Dingle Bay. For Corbeg and Bray, the Sep paid three beeves, in other words, three beefs or heads of cattle, with a value of 40 shillings for Daugolo and four shillings, 16 pence and two white groats for Canbeg. Cool tinnies and Feyman were more expensive. For all of these, Slug Cormac paid beeves worth three pounds for Daugolo and three shillings and one white groat for Canbeg. Daugolo and Canbeg are two of the types of services or taxes imposed in the McCarthy Moore Lordship. It's unclear what Daugolo means, although it was very common in Desmond. In the notes to the UCC Celt site, it is suggested that Dao comes from the Irish dove or black, and the original word could have been dove gyal or black rent. Can beg is easier to understand. Originally it was kion viog, meaning a small or petty tax, and was a tax for the Lord's wife. Some of the other common impositions included Garmslua, the rising up of troops, Sarin or Sarhain, a payment made in victuals, Kudi, Kudiha, a night's maintenance for the Lord and his retinue, and specific charges for Kern and Galloglass. Interestingly, these are largely absent in Valencia. It is only stated that Schluck Cormac, included as one of the Seps 
unfriendly to McCarthy Moore, pay an uncertain siren to the Earl when he passes through their lands. Two more important points about Schluck Cormac. On the Valencia map, symbols of houses are drawn for all the townlands mentioned. Not contained in the text, but present in the map, is Crompio, with a small drawing of a house on it. This is most likely the small village on Brayhead whose ruins can still be seen. These have been excavated a number of times and it seems to have emerged out of a farm and existed from the 12th to the 17th centuries. It's very possible that it was finally destroyed or abandoned after Cromwellian troops landed on the island. Finally, due to its position, Slicked Cormac undoubtedly had access to some boats or ships and must have controlled some of the important fisheries around Valencia, notably Balintia, the area between Valencia and Port McGee. The second sept on the island, Slicked Donald Rick, were believed to be friends of McCarthy Moore, unlike Slicked Cormac. They held Cormore Ballyherney, called Ballyherney Moore in the survey, which includes the present village of Chapeltown, and also Glanleam. The map of Valencia is not the most accurate in terms of shape, yet with the names of the townlands it is possible to get a better idea of the division of land. While Schlick Cormac held the north and northwest of the island, probably running to the northeastern slopes of Yercon Mountain, where the slate quarry is now located, Schlick Donald Rick held the central part of the island, running from somewhere near the current bridge through Chapeltown to Glanleam and Dohilla. For Ballyherney and Cormor, they paid a dogolo of three beeves, worth a total of forty pounds sterling, also paying four shillings sterling, four pence, and two white groats for Canbeg. For Glanleam, which probably included Dohilla, they paid less, since it was only half a quarter of land, namely one point five beeves, worth twenty shillings, and two shillings, four pence, and two white groats for Canbeg. No other impositions are mentioned. Now to the most complicated part, the holdings of McCarthy Moor. On the map, this consists of the lower part of the island, specifically Kilbeg, Kilmore, and what is called Ballyherney Ura, which seems to con correspond to the bottom part of the present Ballyherney East. Kilbeg and Kilmore are out of position. McCarthy Moor probably held the southeast of the island, essentially east and south of Kilbeg Mountain. Kilmore is no longer a townland name. However, the old Catholic graveyard is called Kilmore and contains a ruined medieval church. This matches up with the map which has a cross over a building in Kilmore. Kilbeg was part of the McCarthy Moor de Mean. However, in the survey it is stated that this had been mortgaged to a Mr. Thomas Denny and Mr. William Humberton. Probably this Denny was related to the Edward Denny who had been granted lands around Tully. Basically, McCarthy Moor mortgaged to them all of his holdings in Valencia, except what he had given to his illegitimate son Donal, which amounted to part of Ballyherney. In addition to land, Humberton and Denny held the fishing rights in the haven of Valencia. Basically, McCarthy Moore seems to have given them possession of the rights to fishing in both approaches to Valencia, from Port McGee and in what is Valencia Harbour proper. All of this would have been very valuable. However, things were a little confused in Valencia Harbour, the fishing rights around Begnish were now held by Nicholas Brown. Probably, this is the far side of Begnish. Indeed, Nicholas Brown also held the right to Ballycarbury Castle and the lands around it. However, since this was far from any English garrison, and part had been given to McCarthy Moore's illegitimate brother Donna, it is doubtful whether Brown managed to get hold of these lands before the end of the Nine Years' War. Some of the lands around Ballyherney Castle had also been given to Donald McCarthy, McCarthy Moore's illegitimate son. Indeed, when the Spaniards arrived in Kinsale, it appears that Donald McCarthy, in many ways the most talented McCarthy in this period, held the castle. One of the Spaniards who landed in Munster in 1601 recommended that a future Spanish fleet come to Valencia Harbour. It would have made a much better landing place than Kinsale. Most of McCarthy Moore's fishing rights in his lordship had been mortgaged, illustrating the wealth that these generated. Caught between the Earl of Desmond, an incompetent queen, 
newcomers with a desire for land and money, Donald McCarthy Moore was always in a difficult position. He was neither the most able nor the worst Gaelic lord of his time. He managed to maintain his autonomy, but left his lordship weak and was an ordinary leader at a time when extraordinary leadership was needed. Florence McCarthy succeeded him and had himself inaugurated as the last McCarthy Moore in 1600. However, he tried to play both sides in a clash between Hugh O'Neill's confederacy and Elizabeth, and it ended up seriously weakening the Gaelic side in Munster. The survey of McCarthy Moore's land in the late 1590s is an invaluable asset. It is a snapshot of Gaelic landholding in its final years. It is priceless and confusing, wonderful and problematic, just like any good historical document. It also gives us a very good idea of Valencia at this period. It was an important territory, both because of its strategic location and because of its valuable fishing. The land was divided between two McCarthy Seps, one friendly to McCarthy Moore and the other not, and McCarthy Moore himself. However, illustrating the changes that were coming, most of McCarthy Moore's holdings had been mortgaged, as had his fishing rights. All of this would rapidly be swept away. Gaelic Ireland would be destroyed. Land ownership would change dramatically. In the aftermath of the Gaelic defeat in the Nine Years' War and the flight of the Earls, the Gaelic lordships would disappear. Some McCarthys would anglicise themselves and survive for a while, such as the McCarthys of Muscari, but the Cromwellian and Williamite Wars resulted in their downfall. The many Seps who held land in McCarthy Lordship would be swept aside and disappear. Schlick Cormac and Schlick Donald Vrick would vanish in this maelstrom in the brutal and often bloody destruction of Gaelic Ireland. For this reason, we are fortunate that we know so much about Valencia in the twilight of the Gaelic period. <laughs>